Chapter Eight of High Adventure, a narrative of air fighting in France by James Norman Hall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti.com. High Adventure, a narrative of air fighting in France by James Norman Hall. Chapter Eight, One Hundred Hours. A little more than a year after our first meeting in the Paris restaurant, which has so many pleasant memories for us, Drew completed his first one hundred hours of flight over the lines, an event in the life of an airman which calls for a celebration of some sort. Therefore, having been granted leave for the afternoon, the two of us came into the old French town of Bar-le-Duc by the toy train which wanders down from the Verdun sector. We had dinner in one of those homelike little places where the food is served by the proprietor himself. On this occasion it was served hurriedly, and the bill presented promptly at eight o'clock. Our host was very sorry, but les sales boches vont servir, messieurs. They had come the night before, a dozen houses destroyed, women and children killed and maimed. With a full moon to guide them, they would be sure to return to-night. A cette guerre quad fine. he offered us a refuge until our train should leave. Usually, he said, he played solitaire while waiting for the Germans, but with houses tumbling about one's ears, he much preferred company, and my wife and I are old people. She is very deaf. Here is month. She hears nothing. J.B. declined the invitation. A brave way that would be to finish our evening, he said as we walked down the silent street. I wanted to say, monsieur, I have just finished my first one hundred hours of flight at the front but he wouldn't have known what that means. I said, no, he wouldn't have known. Then we had no further talk for about two hours. A few soldiers, late arrivals, were prowling about in the shadow of the houses, searching for food and a warm kitchen where they might eat it. Some insistent ones pounded on the door of a restaurant far in the distance. That's donc patron, noif avon fame, mon de du. Escalate tout his mons est mortsi? Only a host of phantom listeners that dwelt in the lone house then stood listening in the quiet of the moonlight to that voice from the world of men. It was that kind of silence, profound, tense, ghost-like. We walked through street after street from one end of the town to the other, and saw only one light, a faint glimmer, which came from a slit of a cellar window, almost on the level of the pavement. We were curious, no doubt. At any rate, we looked in. A woman was sitting on a cot bed, with her arms around two little children. They were snuggled up against her, and both fast asleep. But she was sitting very erect, in a strained, listening attitude, staring straight before her. Since that night we have believed, both of us, that if wars can be won only by haphazard night bombardments of towns where there are women and children, then they had far better be lost. But I am writing a journal of high adventure, of a cleaner kind, in which all the resources in skill and cleverness of one set of men are pitted against those of another set. We have no bomb dropping to do, and there are but few women and children living in the territory over which we fly. One hundred hours is not a great while, as time is measured on the ground, but in terms of combat patrols, the one hundredth part of it has held more of an adventure in the true meaning of the word than we have had during the whole of our lives previously. At first we were far too busy learning the rudiments of combat to keep an accurate record of flying time. We thought our aeroplane clocks convenient pieces of equipment, rather than necessary ones. I remember coming down from my first air battle, and the breathless account I gave of it, at the bureau breathless and vague. Lieutenant Talbot listened quietly, making out the Comte de Rendu as I talked. When I had finished, he emphasized the haziness of my answers to his questions by quoting them. Region, you know, that big wood, time. This morning, of course, rounds fired, oh, a lot, etc. Not until we had been flying for a month or more did we learn how to make the right use of our clocks and of our eyes while in the air. We listened with amazement to the after-patrol talk at the mess. We learned more of what actually happened on our sorties after they were over than while they were in progress. 
All of the older pilots missed seeing nothing which there was to see. They reported the numbers of the enemy planes encountered, the type, where seen and when. They spotted batteries, trains, and stations back of the enemy lines, gave the hour precisely, reported any activity on the roads. In moments of exasperation, Drew would say, I think they are stringing us. This is all a put-up job. Certainly this did appear to be the case at first, for we were air-blind. We saw little of the activity all around us, and details on the ground had no significance. How were we to take thought of time and place and altitude, note the peculiarities of enemy machines, count their numbers, and store all this information away in memory at the moment of combat? This was a great problem. What I need, J.B. used to say, is a traveling private secretary. I'll do the fighting, and he can keep the diary. I needed one, too, a man air-wise and battle-wise, who could calmly take note of my clock, altimeter, temperature, and pressure dials, identify exactly the locality on my map, count the numbers of the enemy, estimate their approximate altitude, all this, when the air was crisscrossed with streamers of smoke from machine-gun tracer bullets and opposing aircraft were maneuvering for position, diving and firing at each other, spiraling, nose-spinning, wing-slipping, climbing in a confusing intermingling of tricolored cocards and black crosses. We made gradual progress, the result being that our patrols became a hundredfold more fascinating, sometimes, in fact, too much so. It was important that we should be able to read the ground, but more important still to remember that what was happening there was only of secondary concern to us. Often we became absorbed in watching what was taking place below us, to the exclusion of any thought of aerial activity, our chances for attack or of being attacked, the view from the air of a heavy bombardment or of an infantry attack under cover of barrage fires is a truly terrible spectacle and in the air one has a feeling of detachment which is not easily overcome. Yet it must be overcome, as I have said, and cannot say too many times for the benefit of any young airman who may read this journal. During an offensive the air swarms with planes. They are at all altitudes, from the lowest artillery reagage machines to a few hundreds of meters, to the highest avions de chasse at six thousand meters and above, Reglage, photographic, and reconnaissance planes have their particular work to do. They defend themselves as best they can, but almost never attack. Combat avions, on the other hand, are always looking for victims. They are the ones chiefly dangerous to the unwary pursuit pilot. Drew's first official victory came as the result of a one-sided battle with an albatross single-seater, whose pilot evidently did not know there was an enemy within miles of him. No more did J.B. for that matter. It was pure accident, he told me afterward. He had gone from Reims to the Argonne Forest without meeting a single German, and I didn't want to meet one, for it was Thanksgiving Day. It has associations for me. You know, I'm a New Englander. It is not possible to convince him that it has any real significance for men who were not born on the North Atlantic seaboard. Well, all the way he had been humming over the river and through the woods to grandfather's house we go to himself it is easy to understand why he didn't want to meet a german he must have been in a curiously mixed frame of mind he covered the sector again and passed over reims going northeast then he saw the albatross and if you had been standing on one of the towers of the cathedral you would have seen a very unequal battle the German was about two kilometers inside his own lines, and at least a thousand meters below. Drew had every advantage. He didn't see me until I opened fire, and then, as it happened, it was too late. My gun didn't jam. The German started falling out of control, Drew following him down until he lost sight of him in making a verrage. I leaned against the canvas wall of a hangar, registering incredulity three times out of seven to make a conservative estimate. We fight inconclusive battles because of faulty machine-guns or defective ammunition. The ammunition, most of it that is bad, comes from America. While Drew was giving me the details, an orderly from the Bureau brought word that an enemy machine had just been reported shot down on our sector, 
It was Drew's albatross. But he nearly lost official credit for having destroyed it, because he did not know exactly the hour when the combat occurred. His watch was broken, and he had neglected asking for another before starting. He judged the time of the attack approximately as 2.30, and the infantry observers reporting the result gave it as twenty minutes to three. The region in both cases coincided exactly, however, and, fortunately, Drew's was the only combat which had taken place in that vicinity during the afternoon. For an hour after his return he was very happy. He had won his first victory, always the hardest to gain, and had been complimented by the commandant, by Lieutenant Nugasser, the Roy de Aces, and by other French and American pilots. There is no petty jealousy among airmen, and in our group the esprit de corps is unusually fine. Rivalry is keen, but each squadron takes almost as much pride in the work of the other squadrons as it does in its own. The details of the result were horrible. The albatross broke up two thousand meters from the ground, one wing falling within the French lines. Drew knew what it meant to be wounded and falling out of control, but his spad held together. He had a chance for his life. Supposing the German to have been merely wounded, an airman's joy in victory is a short-lived one. Nevertheless, a curious change takes place in his attitudes towards his work as the months pass. I can best describe it in terms of Drew's experience and my own. We came to the front feeling deeply sorry for ourselves and for all airmen of whatever nationality whose lives were to be snuffed out in their promising beginnings. I used to play The Minstrel Boy to War Has Gone on a tin flute, and Drew wrote poetry. While we were waiting for our first machine, he composed the airman's rendezvous, written in the manner of Alan Seeger's poem. And I, in the wide fields of air, must keep with him my rendezvous. It may be I shall meet him there when clouds like sheep move slowly through the pathless meadows of the sky, and their cool shadows go beneath. I have a rendezvous with death some summer noon of white and blue. There is more of it in the same manner, all of which he read me in a husky voice. I, too, was ready to weep at our untimely fate. The strange thing is that his prophecy came so very near being true. He had the first draft of the poem in his breast pocket when wounded, and has kept the gory relic to remind him, not that he needs reminding, of the airy manner in which he cancelled what ought to have been a bona fide appointment. I do not mean to reflect in any way upon Alan Seeger's beautiful poem. Who can doubt that it is a sincere as well as a perfect expression of a mood common to all young soldiers? Drew was just as sincere in writing his verses, and I put all the feeling I could into my tin whistle interpretation of the minstrel boy. What I want to make clear is that a soldier's moods of self-pity are fleeting ones, and if he lives, he outgrows them. Imagination is an especial curse to an airman, particularly if it takes a gloomy or morbid turn. We used to write, to whom it may concern, letters before going out on patrol, in which we left directions for the notification of our relatives and the disposal of our personal effects in case of death. Then we would climb into our machines, thinking, this may be our last sortie. We may be dead in an hour, in half an hour, in twenty minutes. We planned splendidly spectacular ways in which we were to be brought down, always omitting one, however, the most horrible as well as the most common, in flames. Thank fortune we have outgrown this second and belated period of adolescence, and can now take a healthy interest in our work. Now an inevitable part of the daily routine is to be shelled, persistently, methodically, and often accurately shelled. Our interest in this may, I suppose, be called healthy, inasmuch as it would be decidedly unhealthy to become indifferent to the activities of the German anti-aircraft gunners. It would be far-fetched to say that any airman ever looks forward zestfully to the business of being shot at with one hundred and fives and seventy-fives, if they are well placed, are unpleasant enough. After one hundred hours of it, we have learned to assume that attitude of contemptuous toleration which is the manner common to all pilots de chase, 
we know that the chances of a direct hit are almost negligible, and that we have the blue dome of the heavens in which to maneuver. Furthermore, we have learned many little tricks by means of which we can keep the gunners guessing. By way of illustration, we are patrolling, let us say, at 3,500 meters, crossing and recrossing the lines, following the patrol leader who has his motor throttled down so that we may keep well in formation. The guns may be silent for the moment, but we know well enough what the gunners are doing. We know exactly where some of the batteries are and the approximate location of all of them along the sector, and we know from earlier experience when we come within range of each individual battery. Presently, one of them begins firing in bursts of four shells. If their first estimate of our range has been an accurate one, if they place them uncomfortably close, so that we can hear all too well above the roar of the motors, the rendering grum, grum of the shells as they explode, we sail calmly to all outward appearances on, maneuvering very little. The gunners, seeing that we are not disturbed, will alter the ranges four times out of five, which is exactly what we want them to do. The next burst will be hundreds of meters below or above us, whereupon we show signs of great uneasiness, and the gunners, thinking they have our altitude, begin to fire like demons. We employ our well-earned impunity in preparing for the next series of battles, or in thinking of the cost to Germany, at one hundred francs a shot, of all this futile shelling. Drew, in particular, loves this cost-accounting business, and I must admit that much pleasure may be had in it, after patrol. They rarely fire less than fifty shells at us during a two-hour patrol. Making a low general average, the number is near one hundred and fifty. In our present front, where aerial activity is fairly brisk and the sector is a large one, three or four hundred shells are wasted upon us often before we have been out an hour. We have memories of all the good batteries from Flanders to the Vosage Mountains, battery after battery. We make their acquaintance along the entire sector whenever we go. Many of them, of course, are mobile, so that we never lose the sport of searching for them. Only a few days ago we located one of this kind which came into action in the open by the side of the road, First we saw the flashes, and then the shell bursts, in the same cadence. We tipped up and fired at him in bursts of twenty to thirty rounds, which is the only way airmen have of passing the time of day with their friends, the enemy anti-aircraft gunners who ignore the art of camouflage. But we can converse with them after a fashion, even though we do not know their exact position. It will be long before this chapter of my journal is in print. Having given no indication of the date of writing, I may say without indiscretion that we are again on the Champagne front. We have a wholesome respect for one battery here, a respect it has justly earned by shooting which is really remarkable. We talk of this battery which is east of Reims, and not far distant from Nagent la Base, and take professional pride in keeping its gunners in ignorance of their fine marksmanship. We signal them their bad shots, which are better than the good ones of most of the batteries on the sector, by doing stunts, a barrel turn, a loop, two or three turns of a yarl. As for their good shots, they are often so very good that we are forced into acrobacy of a wholly individual kind. Our avions have received many scars from their shells, between 4,500 and 5,000 meters. Their bursts have been so close under us that we have been lifted by the concussions and set down violently again at the bottom of the vacuum, and this on a clear day when the chase machine is almost invisible at that height and despite its speed of two hundred kilometers an hour. On a gray day when we are flying between twenty-five hundred and three thousand meters beneath a film of cloud, they repay the honor we do them by our acrobatic turns. They bracket us put barrages between us and our own lines, give us more trouble than all the other batteries on the sector combined. For this reason, it is all the more humiliating to be forced to land with motor trouble, just at the moment when they are paying off some old scores. This happened to Drew while I have been writing up my journal. Coming out of a tonneau in answer to three coups from the battery, his propeller stopped dead. By planing flatly, the wind was dead ahead, and the area back of the first lines, there is a wide one, 
crossed by many intersecting lines of trenches. He got well over them and chose a field as level as a billiard table for landing ground. In the very center of it, however, there was one post, a small worm-eaten thing, of the color of the dead grass around it. He hit it, just as he was setting his spad on the ground. The only post in a field, acres wide, and it tore a piece of fabric from one of his lower wings. No doubt the crack battery has been given credit for disabling an enemy plane. The honor, such as it is, belongs to our aerial godfather, among whose lesser vices may be included that of practical joking. The remnants of the post were immediately confiscated for firewood by some poloys who were living in a dugout nearby. End of chapter 8